Good evening, thankful family. Again, it is a privilege and a pleasure to be able to come before you this Thursday night to open up God's word, to share with you and and to um, to see what the spirit of God has to say to us. I am just delighted that you thought in that robbery to come and join with us tonight. But your desire to um, to really hear what God has to say and what God is saying to his to his people and particularly to us tonight through this particular um, study, I am more than certain that the Lord is, is going to honor your faithfulness. And I'm just glad, uh, glad that you're here. Um, but before we get into the word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. And we just bless you, God. We bless you and we just thank you again for being so good, so gracious, so kind, so loving. Um, so faithful, so long suffering unto us, Lord, and, and the list can just go go on and on and on. But um, but we just pray right now in, in the name of Jesus that uh, that you would just take our our hearts uh, felt um, gratitude, Lord God, for all that you've done, for all that you are, for all that you're doing, Lord God, with us and in us and, and through us, Lord God, around us. Um, because we know that you love us and your heart is always for our good, that you're uh, doing something, Lord God, to, to make us all the better. But more importantly, you're doing something, Lord, to ultimately bring yourself glory. And, um, and we just thank you and we just praise you, Lord God, that you give us the opportunity to partner with you, Lord God, in glorifying yourself. So we just ask right now in the name of Jesus that you'd help us to prepare our hearts and minds for what you have for us this night again. Um, we know that you have something special for us since you have allowed us to, to see this time and you're not a waster of time that uh, that you have prepared something special for us. So as I plea, Lord God, as I cry that we don't miss what you have for us. Spirit of the living God, we submit ourselves unto you right now to give you free reign to do whatever it is that the Father has sent you to do because um, you can do uh, more in, in an instant, in a, in a nanosecond. Um, than all of us could do in all of the preaching and the teaching in a thousand years. So we just submit ourselves unto you. And we just thank you. We just praise you for what you're going to do in this place tonight. And again, it's not because I'm such a great teacher, but because you're such a good God and giving good gifts to your children is what you do. And uh, for that, Lord God, we're grateful. And we just give you honor. We give you praise and we give you glory again for all good things because they come from you and you alone. It's these that are blessed we ask in your name. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Um, we're coming from the book of First Kings, and we're going to be looking at chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 9. And I'll be reading from the, uh, the English Standard Version, which is, as you all know, that's my, that, that's my baby. That's my favorite. Um, and whatever version that you have, as long as it says B-I-B-L-E, and it has 66 books, as Pastor V likes to say, then, then you're, you're all right. You'll, you'll be good. You'll be good. But here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, uh, the word of the Lord proclaims, As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon had desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name uh, there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing accordingly, according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not like a man on the throne of Israel. But here it comes. If you turn aside from following me, you or your children, not just Solomon, but Solomon and his descendants, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a proverb and byword among all peoples. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss. And they will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt 
and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all of this disaster on them. Now, again, that this particular uh, passage comes um, after chapter eight, after Solomon had had, uh, had really beseeched of the Lord and sought the Lord and, and prayed to the Lord. He blessed him, and but also too, he um, really um, was seeking for the Lord to, to really have his hand on, on this particular house. He, you know, that David wanted to build the, the house of God, but God wouldn't allow him. And, and God was happy that his heart was was to do so. But he said, uh, he said, no, um, you're, you're a man of war. I'm going to allow your son to, to build the, the temple and in your place. And, and David, David was good with that. David, uh, since his heart was, was always toward the Lord, even though there's something that he wanted to do. And God told him, it's that, that's good that you want to do it. I'm, uh, you bless me by, by wanting to, to build a house for me, by thinking that much of me, but that's not, for you to do, I'm going to allow that to. Uh, I'm going to allow your son to do that. Do that, and really, that should be um, a lesson to us all. That uh, there are a lot of things that I'm sure that that we want to do is a lot of things that I want to do um, for the Lord, and and with with all good intentions, wanting to be pleasing unto the Lord. But the uh, one good thing about David is is he sought the Lord and told the Lord what his desire was, and um, the Lord, knowing uh, knowing our hearts, knowing the heart of man. Um, knew that that it was truly um, David's heart was in the right place, but he said that that is not uh, for you to do, and that's again a lesson to us that there's sometimes that our heart can be in the right place, that um, there are things that that we really um, desire to do for God, and 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 God um, I'm sure is 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 pleased with our desire to um, to to honor Him in the things that that we put forth, but. Um, there are times that the Lord just says uh, that's that that's good and 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 thank you in essence for um for the thought, but that's not for for you to do. I'm going to allow someone else to do that particular thing. And and again, that David was good with that, and we need to be good with good with that too. If we're if our desire is truly that uh, that we're not the center of our universe, that God is the center of our universe, and truly that we exist. In order to bring him pleasure and, and to uh, and help uh, put forth his agenda, not our agenda, but help put for, push forth his agenda, then when he tells us that uh, that no, that's that's not for you, then um, um, we should be we should be good with that. But first and foremost, seek the Lord and seek the answer of the Lord, which um, which David did, and in particular that these particular nine verses uh, that they are really um, is a re really a renewing um, of a covenant that, that he had made with, uh, with David. And um, it says that this divine manifestation was probably similar in form to that which Solomon uh, was favored at the beginning of his reign, of, of which is said in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And again, we see that here in verse one, it says, as soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And we know that in Gibeon, that uh, that he appeared to him in, in a dream. So um, evidently that this pretty much transpired the, uh, the same way. Um, we have no means of judging as to the precise time of the occurrence, but the close connection of thought between what God here says to Solomon and the prayer um, at the dedication leads us to suppose that it took place immediately after that event. So we, um, because here it says that after he had finished building um, the Lord's house and also to his house and everything else that he wanted to build, that this is when the, the Lord appeared to him. So evidently that this took place um, um, sometime relatively, a relatively short time after he had um, dedicated the, the temple and um, dedicated the temple to the Lord, him as well as the, the people, which uh, in chapter eight, chapter seven and chapter eight, they made a, um, a details it um, pretty good. So if you get the opportunity, I um, pray that you go and, and read that part, 
chapter eight, it's chapter seven in Second Chronicles, but in um, in chapter eight of of First Kings. And there are a couple of things that uh, that we see in this particular passage. Uh, first, um, we see the the faithfulness of God and the uh, and the blessings that are results um, when we are faithful. It shows the faithfulness of God and how um, God. He blesses when we are, in essence, faithful unto him, that the fidelity um, fidelity of God is is assured that um, he's going to he's going to be faithful unto us. He, he can't help but be faithful to to us. Why? Because he's got to be faithful to him, to himself. Uh, you know, that's why he always says that um, that I swear by by myself because there's no one no one greater to, to swear by that. Uh, I, I, for for my name's sake, because his 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 character is um is pretty much on the line, and then he can do nothing but be faithful. And then this talks about it really shows the the faithfulness of God. And first and foremost, we see that uh, it says in answering of prayers that if if we don't get anything else out of this lesson tonight, we really need to understand that God answers prayer. That God answers prayer, and here that um, that we see in, in verse three that it says, "The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea.' That I have heard your prayer and your plea." Well, and then he goes on to to really to to say what what he has to say. But first and foremost, the the faithfulness of God in in answering prayer that the Lord hears our prayer and the Lord that he he hears our our plea, you know, that there's no pure breath of, of supplication, um, which is the incense of the heart, that when we truly um, seek after the Lord and, and, and pray to the Lord and cry out to the Lord in, in sincerity and, and with a pure heart, that that is, that is incense um, that goes up before the Lord. That's, uh, that's the, the, the sweet um, savor in his nostrils when our supplications, when our supplications are pure, and they go before him is that that's the incense of the heart. Um, and it ever ascends to, to heaven and it's not in vain. It's not in vain. You know, that sometimes we, we can cry out unto the Lord and, and our, and our emotions that we can feel as if, you know, that, uh, that we're not, um, we're not making any headway and that the Lord may not be hearing and that the Lord may not be, um, May not be his his ears may be shut, but if if our hearts are pure before God and 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 our intentions are pure, if our heart is pure, then our intentions will be pure. That um, that there is no supplication that goes before God that He doesn't hear. It, not none of that is it is ever in vain. That the that the Lord is going to He's going to to respond because He talks about if we go before Him pure in heart, then we go before Him. Um, not arrogantly, not in pride, but we go to him in humility, and that is what what God honors. Uh, because again, it talks about in one of my favorite um, chapters uh, in Philippians chapter two. It talks about how how Jesus, the essence of what he did, is because of his humility, is because of of him thinking less about himself and more about um, bringing pleasure unto God, and and. His love for us that uh, that he he humbled himself and said that he took a form from a man. That's what brought him from heaven uh, down here to earth to, to hang out with us and to, to to be among us. It's all about because of his 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 humility. So when we are pure of heart and our supplications go before God, pure that he's going to answer. He's going to answer our prayer. Why? Because he's faithful. And he said that he would. He says that when when we go before him pure and we go before him humble, he that's that that's what he desires. That's what draws him to uh, uh, that particular pr prayers because of the humility and, and the pure of heart. So when we go before him with our supplications that are pure, he's going to. He's going to answer and is, is not in vain, regardless of how we feel, or regardless of what we think, um, regardless of, of what the enemy is saying. And a lot of times our minds, it doesn't matter about any of that. If we go before the Lord, pure in heart, that he's going to answer. He's going to answer. He's going to answer.
because God does not disappoint our hopes and longings. Every cry of faith that goes up to our Heavenly Father comes back in due time in some form of benediction, that every cry, every cry of our heart comes back in due time with some form of, of heavenly benediction. Again, it's not in vain. God, God responds. God answers one way, one form, or one fashion. Moreover, the, the answer is often far larger and richer than our expectations. He does exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. And we see that in, in the book of, of Ephesians. Because here we see that Solomon had prayed that your eyes may be opened night and day toward this house. And that, again, was in chapter 8, um, verse 28. That was what, what Solomon had prayed unto the Lord, that your eyes may be open night and day towards your house. And this is what um, God responds unto, uh, unto Solomon here in, in chapter 9. Is, um, God answers, my eyes and my heart will be there all the time. That what Solomon had asked for, because his heart was pure and his desire was for was for God, God to be honored, for God to be glorified, and um, and for the uh, for the for the people of God to be able to have um, the presence of God in their midst. That he was doing this for all the right reasons. That exactly what it was that he prayed for, God answered. Man, that's in, that's incredible. But this is the ticket that when our hearts are are pure, and and um, and we are um, in humility before the Lord, then we're not going to we're not going to pray pray selfish prayers. You know, we're not going to um, pray for for things uh, uh, out of pride. We're not going to pray for um, things that are really outside of the, uh, the the will of God. Is that our hearts are going to be um, towards God and towards the things that, that God desires. And since our hearts are, are toward God and the things that God desires, when we ask God, because we're asking him for the thing that he desires, then he's going to, uh, he's going to grant our request that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house. And God says in, in verse three, my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. The very heart of God dwells where his uh, beseeching people are. The very heart of God dwells where his beseeching people are, where the people who, who are really seeking um, after him and, and, and are, are running towards him and, and hearts are, are right towards him, that God's heart is with those people or, or in the midst and dwells with those type of individuals. This shows the gracious divine accommodations God makes to our human wants and weaknesses. God has a tender heart towards us as well as an obedient or an observant eye. That God has a tender heart towards us as well as an observant eye. Um, so you take note, the con the constancy of his grace. Let's take note of the constancy of his grace. He says forever, for all time. He says, my eyes and my heart will be there for all time, forever. That That is, that is going is, is gonna to be perpetual. It's going to be perpetual. It's going to be, be there for forever. Um, it kind of re reminds us of what, what Jesus told us. He says that, uh, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you for always, perpetually, is that I'm, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. That when, when God blesses us with things and blesses us with giftings and callings, the word of God says that, that he gives them to us um, for all time, perpetually, that his gifts and his callings are, are without repentance, that when he gives them, he gives them to us perpetually. So that uh, really um, talks about uh, the tender heart of God and that the tender heart that God has towards us, um, whatever he, he records, wherever, I'm sorry, he records his name, there he dwells. Is that uh, that he told Sid that he was going to have his, his name on, on that place for all time. So that is, that is where he was going to dwell. When he blesses, when he um, gives or forgives, it is forever. If grace 
is canceled, if the benediction is withdrawn, the fault is ours, not his. That if something transpires, and and because we know the the end of the story, and we know how um, how Israel and Solomon's sons, in essence, and Solomon um, in the latter part of his life, that uh, started um, chasing after other gods, that uh, that uh, a destruction ultimately came to the uh, to the house of Israel. But it wasn't because of of God's unfaithfulness. It was because of the the faithfulness um, of the people. Um, in uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 verse th 13 it says that though we believe though we believe not yet he abideth faithfully he cannot deny himself that there are there are two things that um that it talks about in in these particular verses it talks about that if you're faithful then these things will transpire <laughs> if you're not faithful then these things will um, will transpire, but he put it put it on on um, Solomon and on Solomon's descendants uh, exactly. You know which which path that you're going to take. It's it's it's, it's up to you that something is, is going to transpire. It can be good if you're obedient, but it can be bad. No, but it it will be good. Let me rephrase that. It will be good. If you're obedient, so it will be be a, a blessing unto you if you're obedient. But if you're unfaithful, and um, and you you go into apostasy, then it's it won't be good. But something is going to transpire. Either it's going to be blessings, um, or curse or cursing, curses. So the first thing we see it talks about the faithfulness of God, but also too here we talk of, it talks about the uh, the repetition um, of the promise says, if you will walk before me as David, your father, walked with integrity of heart and uprightness. And that's a that's a, a truly interesting statement. It talks about walking uprightly with integrity of heart and uprightness. Now, um, as David did. Now, we, we all know that um, that David was was by far. He wasn't a perfect individual. The scriptures bear witness um, to that particular fact. But there is uh, one thing that is is constant when it talks about. Um, the integrity of the heart or the integrity of, of David's heart and his um, uprightness, um, you know, that David's loyalty um, never varied, that David may have, have done some, some bad things and um, David may not have been a particularly good father. And we all know what transpired between uh, David and Bathsheba and, and, um, and what he did to, to her husband, Uriah. And, the, and those were, were, were all bad things. But even in all of that, that, uh, that David had an um, a unwavering loyalty unto the Lord, an unwavering loyalty to the Lord, that he, he never, ever had the desire to seek after other gods. Did he do some things wrong? Absolutely. But his heart was always was for God and always was towards God. So even when it was brought to his attention when he was called out for for his adultery and, and in essence what he did with um with Uriah that uh, the because his heart was always towards God is that he immediately immediately repented immediately repented so that that uh, shows the nature of of what um what David's heart was and that is in essence what what he is saying to um saying to Solomon Solomon you you're not going to you're not going to be you're not going to be perfect but I need you to be have integrity of heart and um, uprightness. I need, you, I need your heart to have integrity in the sense that you have you don't have a desire and will not pursue after after other gods or, as the scriptures like to say, go a whoring after um, after other gods. That I need you to to have integrity of other gods, just like David. Did, have integrity of not going after other gods, just like um, David did. That uh, David's allegiance was always to truth. That his allegiance was he, even with um, with Bathsheba. That when when the prophet brought it before him, he didn't try to make excuses. He didn't try to rationalize. Um, he he knew that that he had sinned. 
and um, and that he needed to, uh, to to get it right before the Lord. That his his allegiance to truth was was always there. Um, so with all things spiritual, it is always a matter of the heart. With all things spiritual, it's always a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of um, of what goes on outwardly. It all matters about what goes on inwardly. It's always a matter of the heart. So that's why he, he said integrity of the heart. Not, I, don't, I don't just want you to do the right thing. I want you to do the right thing for the right reasons. You know, um, that's with, with us as well. That uh, Jesus said that, you know, man looks out, the, out at the outer, but God looks at the, the, in heart, at the heart. It's, it's more important why you do what you do than it is what you do because you can be doing all the right things. And even from a, from a biblical perspective, you could be doing all the right things, but your heart um, may not be right toward the things that you're doing, or you, you may not, your heart may not be in the things that you're doing. You could just be going, going through the motion, going through the motions, or you're doing what you're doing for um, ulterior motives. But with God and spiritual things, it's always about um, a matter uh, of the heart. Furthermore, the promise is reiterated um, as a sacred and an unbreakable engagement, which God on his part will never break. All divine promises are sure. All divine um, promises are sure. All we have to do is place ourselves in line of their fulfillment and all is well with us. That all God's promises are sure. If we want to see them come forth, all we have to do is line ourselves up with the fulfillment. As with um, God told Solomon, he says, uh, you know, hey, if you walk um, uprightly before me with integrity of heart, that I, I am faithful that all of these things are going to transpire. But conversely, if you don't, I am faithful that all of these things, all of the, these other things are going to, uh, going to transpire as well. That the promises of God are steadfast as ordinances of heaven and earth. And you know, what's, what's interesting is that when we talk about the natural laws, the, the natural laws uh, of God are in essence, his promises in the material realm. We, they, they, you know, gravity is, is, is a natural law. Well, in all actuality, that's a that's a, a promise of God that that you know if, if I drop this that this is that this is going to fall. But it's just a promise of God in, in the natural realm that you know they call them um, uh, natural laws or you know things of that nature. But um, that that's a, in essence just a that a promise of God that you know if you do this, this is this is going to happen. That gravity is going to take place. If I drop it, it's, it's going to fall 32, I believe, feet feet per second. That God is is faithful to the to the things that He has set forth, to the promises that He says that how nature is going to work. It, he talked about uh, a lot of that in Genesis. He talked about that you know, hey, if you plant plant this particular seed, that everything's going to reproduce after after like kind. There are promises that that God has made in the natural um, realm. And God, we can see all of those things um, being fulfilled. So if God fulfills those things in the natural realm, why wouldn't he be faithful to fulfill those things in the, in the spiritual realm? That he's just as steadfast in the spiritual, spiritual things and in biblical things as he is in the natural things. So if we, can, if we can believe that gravity, that if we drop it, this thing is going to drop 32 feet per second. And if we believe that if we plant this, this um this apple seed that we're going to get a get an apple tree and we believe that if we if we make um two cows that we're going to get a cow or, or a bull or or things of that nature everything produced after after like kind that um if we can have faith in those particular things in the natural realm why because there are promises and there are laws of god where there are promises and there are laws of god that happen in the spiritual realm so if, if he's faithful in the natural he'll be even more so faithful when it comes to uh, to promises in the supernatural. Again, we just looked at uh, two aspects of the faithfulness of God. One, the answering of prayer, but also two, the second one being the repetition of his promises. And that was the faithfulness of God or the fidelity of God. But now we're going to take a look at the infidelity of man 
or the unfaithfulness of man and the uh, fatal consequences that follow that unfaithfulness or that infidelity. Um, you know, one of the the most loving things that a person can do for another person is to admonish them when they uh, see them doing something wrong, or when they see them going um, in the wrong direction. But also, too, is um, to give them a warning that uh, that if they do go the wrong way, that certain things will befall them. And that's exactly what God did here in the latter part of um, of this particular uh, passage of Scripture. He's letting Solomon know um, that if, you know, if he doesn't stay upright before him, as a matter of fact, it says, but if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, that certain things, certain bad things were going to uh, befall him. And again, that this is uh, God showing proof of his love to Solomon, that um, because he is giving him this warning, is that in essence, it, it shows that uh, that the Lord loves him. But also, too, that um, it was just the, the plainness and the straightforwardness of what he uh, what he said unto um, um, what he said unto Solomon. He says, but if you turn aside from following me, you and your children and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go to serve other gods and worship them, then certain things were going to follow. He he pretty much just, just laid it out to him um, plainly. You know, he didn't have to decipher it. He didn't have to try to figure it out. It was it was none of those things is that um, because of the, the loving kindness and the mercy of God, he just told um, told Solomon plainly that uh, that if he wasn't faithful um, and, and he did turn aside, that certain things were going to uh, going to transpire, that, you know, that there were no trumpets that were sounding, there was nothing that was dramatic, is that God simply set before him that particular day, life and good or death and evil. He just said, you know, it's, it's, it's your choice that um, that one of these two things are going to transpire. Either it can be uh, life and blessing to you, or it can be, you know, death and, and, and curses to you or death and evil to you. But the but the choice is, is yours. Now, you would think that someone um, of Solomon's wisdom who had been, you know, granted and, and pretty much blessed with a, with a whole lot of, of wisdom from God, you would think that they didn't necessarily um, need a warning. But in all actuality, all of us um, need warnings. It doesn't matter how how long you live or how wise that you are, all of us um, need to need to be warned from time to time from, um, by God. And, and he does that um, out of his out of his loving kindness towards us, that, that all of us um, need to need to be warned that he, he lets us know that uh, in on both aspects that, you know, faithfulness has consequences, it, but the consequences are good, but unfaithfulness. It has consequences as well. But he, as with, he did with Solomon, he does them with us as well. He, he places, he gives us both sides and then pretty much tells us, um, what's going to transpire. And he leaves it up to us in order to, uh, to make the choice. He doesn't force it, uh, doesn't force feed it on us. It, he leaves it, um, unto us, um, in order to, to make, make the choice. So we see here that uh, we are reminded that the faithfulness of God has a dark as well as a bright side to it. As a cloud that guided the march of the Israelites out of Egypt was a light to them, but a source of blinding confusion and miserable discomfort to the um, Egyptians. So this and every other attribute of God bears a different aspect towards us according to the relation in which we stand to it the side on which we place ourselves. The the same light that was, in essence, leading um, the nation of Israel was a blessing to them because of uh, where they were in relation, in a relationship to God. But that same light, even though that it was a blessing to the nation of Israel, is in essence, it, it brought a, a discomfort to the uh, to the Egyptians and that it, it, it wasn't a blessing to them. It brought confusion. And, and discomfort unto them because they weren't on the right side with God or they wasn't in right relationship with God. So everything, every attribute that, that God has, you know, depending on whether it blesses us or whether it, it brings death and destruction, it all um, 
is determined by where we stand with God, on on where our relationship is with God, where we are on the on the obedience, um, which side of the obedience and the faithfulness line that we stand. That's that's where where it all hinges. It can be a blessing to us. That the exact same thing can be a blessing to 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 one group of people who are who are faithful and, and heart is right towards God, and the exact same thing can be death and destruction to um to another group of of individuals whose heart is not uh not right before God. So if we are true to Him, every perfection of His being is a joy to us, a God, a glory, and our defense. If if we are true to him, that all of those things are uh, that they they bring blessing um, to him, to us. But if we forsake him, those same things that they become ministers of vengeance, even his love, even God's love, that it can bring about um, blessings and, and it can bring about um, comfort and things of that nature, but by the same token, that same love can bring um, chastening and, and discipline. It all depends, again, on uh, what side of the obedience line that, that we stand, that when we are um, upright before God, that because of God's loving kindness um, towards us and because he does love us, he, he blesses us. But when we are disobedient to us because he does love us, that that same love that brings blessings to us, um, the dark side to that, for lack of a better term, um, is that it can it can bring discipline and it can bring, bring chastisement um, to us. But it's the same attribute, but it all depends on where we stand in relation to him, or whether we get the blessings or whether we we get the, the chastenings. You know, whether in the physical or the spiritual realm, one feature of God's beneficence, um, one, let me read that again. Whether in the physical or the spiritual realm, one feature of the very benef beneficence of God's law is that they must vindicate or they must avenge themselves. Whether in the physical or the spiritual realm, one feature of the very beneficence of God's law is that they must vindicate or or they must avenge themselves. That if you, regardless of, of what it is, whether it's in the natural or whether it's in the spiritual, if you violate the law of God, it's going to avenge itself or it's going to vindicate itself. If you violate the, the, the law of gravity by being on a... Um, uh, a 20 story building and, and jumping off the law of gravity is, is going to is going to vindicate itself is going going to show you um, because you 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 didn't adhere to uh, to the to the law in the natural realm is going to is going to avenge itself and it's the same way with uh, with the law of reciprocity is that the, or the law of reaping and sowing that since everything produces after like kind, that's the law of God. That's both in the in the natural realm and also too in the spiritual realm. That um, the law of sowing and reaping, everything produces after like kind. If you if you sow um, love and, and 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 peace and and um, and things of that nature, those are the things that you will you will reap love and peace. But if you sow you know hatred and and, and discontent. And um, and strife, all of those type of things is that because everything produces after like kind, everything produces after like kind. You're going to reap strife and and, and hatred and and um, discontent, things of that nature. So it all depends again on what side of of the line that you are on. That every attribute of God, every attribute of God, um, it has a, a blessing. But it also too can bring about um, curses. The laws of God they have to have to vindicate themselves when violated. They have to avenge themselves when violated. And we're going to look at three things, and then we're going to close it out. This is um, one of the things that we're going to look at, and that we see in this particular passage is that all human loss and misery spring from forsaking God. Again, it says it. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children. 
then shall all of these woes come upon you. That we have to remember that all sin is a departure from the living God. He says in Jeremiah 2, he says, uh, my people have committed two evils. And the first one, he says that, that they have committed is they have forsaken me. That's that's always where it starts. It always starts with forsaking God and then going to do something else. But number one, it starts with, with forsaking him or it starts with um, idolatry. Even with Adam is that he cut, cast off his allegiance to God when he listened to the voice of the temp tempter. That when we listen to anything other than God and then place that above um, the the voice or the will of God, then that's the very essence of that's the very essence of of idolatry. So anything that we place above God is is really the essence of idolatry. So number one is that all human loss and misery is. Um, comes from uh, forsaking God. Number two, that according to the height of privilege, so is the depth of the condemnation when that privilege is abused. Let me say that again. It says that according to the height of the privilege or according to to what God is, has given us or what God is, has blessed us with or what God has given us the, the privilege to accomplish, so is the depth of the condemnation when that privilege is abused. Again, to whom much is given, much is, much is required. When you're given a lot, when you abuse it, then in essence, the, the depth of the condemnation or the depth of the fall or the depth of the punishment becomes great. One of the things that, uh, that I can recall is, um, is that, you know, back in the day, TBN, um, not TBN, the 700 Club, I'm sorry, uh, Jim Baker, you know, God really blessed him with, 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 uh, with a whole, whole, whole lot. But we see that when, when that was abused, that the fall, um, that the fall was, was great, that the depth of the condemnation was great. Because that privilege was a was abused, the very height of the hollowed house or the house that that God um, allowed Solomon to build that pretty much had his name on it, um, shall make the ruin more conspicuous and more terrible. That you know, it's interesting that God said that um, if they are disobedient, that the name that the house that He placed His name on and that He consecrated. He says that he's going to he's going to bring it to ruin. He says there is no heavier a judgment that God pronounces upon men uh, than when he says, I will curse your blessings. No greater condemnation when God says, I will curse your the thing that I blessed you with. I'm going to I'm going to curse because of because of your dis disobedience. There is no greater condemnation. I'm going to curse the thing that um, that you that I have blessed you with, even though that my name is on it, even though that I've consecrated it, all of those things. If you disobey me because of my laws, that they must avenge themselves or they must vindicate themselves, says I will curse that that I've blessed you with. Man, that's a that's that's tremendous. That's tremendous. And lastly, the last thing is that. The one inevitable penalty of transgression is contempt and scorn. And here we see that it says that I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and and the house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among the people. And the house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by will be um, astonished and will hiss and they will say, why has the Lord done this to the land and to this house? Then they um, will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and led hold and led hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought about contempt. So God says, if idolatry occurs, he will cut off Israel from the land. Um, that he's going to reject the temple and he's going to make Israel a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. Wow, that, that's that's pretty, pretty harsh. You know, to be cut off in this text is used where a person is cut off 
from or excluded from the fellowship of God's people. And if you look at uh, Leviticus 17, 4, and also to verse 9 of that same chapter, you will see uh, that where that particular meaning uh, comes from, is that a person is cut off or, and excluded from the fellowship of God's people. Secondly, when he uses that he's going to reject or that he's going to cast out of the temple implies that he's going to divorce himself from it. That here it says that God will divorce himself from the dwelling he consecrated and placed his name on. That's how serious he is, that, that he blessed it, that this is his dwelling. He consecrated and placed his name on it. But he says that if, if you are disobedient, if you operate in apostasy, even that that I've consecrated and placed my name on, I'm going to divorce myself from it. Wow. That's serious. That's serious. <laughs> and lastly, he says, finally, becoming a byword in ancient times was a calamity. Since all personal and national self-respect or international respect had disappeared. Even strangers in the land would know that these disasters came about because of Israel's unfaithfulness to their covenant with the Lord. That... Um, that they are going to lose all of their their national respect and and other nations are, are are going to disrespect them you know one of the the tremendous things is that when they left from egypt other nations in essence feared them because they knew that they that they had the fear of god and they knew because god was on their side and god favored them um that they could they could accomplish uh, 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 tremendous things because they to get out of Egypt and to get out of Egypt with all of the wealth, pretty much a uh, uh, show that show that um uh, that that was uh, possible or, or that's what transpired because they did have the the favor of God. But here is saying because now that the favor of God is has in essence left them because of their their disobedience, it says that. Uh, that hey, that when when people look at you, is, is that they going, you know, they going to look at you with disdain, in essence, and even strangers are going to know that all of this came about um, because you were disobedient um, unto the Lord and you was not faithful to the covenant that you made to the Lord when you left Egypt. They knew that that you had the favor of the Lord and you were God's covenant people, and that when they looked at you, they they understood that. Well, conversely, and again, as we talked about, the attributes of God has a has a light and a dark side. Well, the dark side of that is that um, because of of God's uh, faithfulness and faithfulness to Himself and 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 true to His word, true to His promises, is that um, because He has to be true to Himself, that when when we are disobedient, that they're going to look at you and. And yeah, that, that same God who favored you and, and, and showered these blessings on you and, and made other nations tremble um, when they saw you. Now they're going to look at you and they're going to look at, look at you with, with disdain and, and, and disrespect. Is that they, they're going to hiss and, and things of that nature. because And that they're going to know that all of this transpired because you were disobedient, because they were disobedient unto God. Wow. That's, that, that's something there. And I'll close with this. It says, when the sword has lost its savor, it is henceforth um, good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. The wicked may be in honor now, but the time is coming when they shall um, awake and shame. They shall awake and... <laughs> the wicked may... <laughs> The wicked may be in honor now, but the time is coming when they shall awake to shame and everlasting contempt. Why? Um, because again, the promises of God and uh, the laws of God that they must they must avenge themselves, they must vindicate themselves. But the big takeaway, more than anything else, is that again, as with Solomon, um, God placed before him. Uh, life and death, blessings and curses, and then gave him the uh, the ability to choose which one. Both of those things, well, one of those things, should I say, is, is always going to happen. 
It's always going to happen. Why? Because the promises of God are true. Every attribute of God has has a blessing side and, and a destructive side. That um, wherever we stand in in relation to that um, determines um, what what we get. But God places it all before us. It's all it's all in our hands. As as He told Solomon in this, that if you're faithful to me, that I'm going to bless you. When you're disobedient, then be just by the nature of disobedience, and I have to be true to myself, that um, that good things are not are not going to follow you. And again, the uh, one of the big takeaways here is the the greater the privilege, the greater the blessing, um, the harder the fall. That you know that this was the temple was a tremendous thing was was the pride of Israel, but when they turned their back from Israel and um, God did exactly what he says that they're going to do. That that pride became a, a source now of, of shame. So let that be a, a warning to us. Just um, be obedient to God, the things of God, and, and blessings will follow us. Hope you had a nice uh, Bible study, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye-bye.